Okay, so what I want to do is cover uh, quite a bit of ground um, throughout the museum's collection, but really uh, in, in the stories that surround uh, elements within our collection. This is uncovering and connecting threads uh, in a room such as this. Um, as you know, there's no place in the world like this, and this is a place just busting with story uh, as much as it is with artifacts. Many of us know... Um, the, uh, this, the, the sort of figures or the statistics about the Canoe Museum, largest collection in the world. We have uh, about 640 canoes or canoe and kayak shaped objects in our collection, plus thousands of small artifacts. Um, the collections committee that I work with right now, we're currently d going through a process which is called rationalizing our, our collection. This is mining it, plumbing it, and, and determining whether or not this collection has the shape uh, and tells, uh, perhaps paints a portrait that we want it to be uh, doing in, the, in 10 years from now. Uh, you have it your, as tools, um, the process of acquisition or accession and deaccession. So acquiring objects or getting rid of them, uh, to put it bluntly. And those protocols and processes and criteria that we work with as we, we think about this. So I have been working with the collections committee to <coughs> To look at what we have here as the museum thinks about picking up and moving to a new location that certainly won't allow us to sprawl like this uh, and uh, make sure that we're bringing with us uh, the Canoe Museum collection that we really want it to be. <coughs> at the same time, the committee is continuing to acquire new objects, maybe six to ten boats a year, uh, so we need to be very careful that we are, are, are creating a collection that, that suits the museum and its mission, its objectives and its mandate. So as we do this, um, I'm learning a lot of uh, really interesting things. One of them is just how versatile canoes can be. and What makes them so versatile? At their core, you have a small boat pointed at both ends, perhaps paddled, facing forward. And these are found around the world. Our collection takes us from Canada right across up into uh, Alaska, Siberia, down into Hawaii, uh, as far as Vietnam, Cambodia, um, uh, certainly the Oceanic Islands, Fiji, uh, Samoa, <coughs> across the globe into Europe, Africa, South America. So it's really an astonishing international portrait. And what makes the canoe so fabulous uh, as a cultural artifact is that it's easy to tinker with. Here we have a very conventional open canoe um, pointed at both ends. Somebody didn't really want to change the boat much, but thought, well, let's, let's put a sail in it. Uh, this is a John Stevenson canoe taken uh, turn of the century. So um, it goes, but it perhaps could go faster if we increase the sail area. You want to get uh, the skipper down nice and low. You've attached a rudder to it. And this is a, an evolving tradition that was happening on both sides of the Atlantic uh, with the, the um, development of canoe clubs, the Royal Canoe Club, the American Canoe Club, and later the Canadian. And um, by putting the skipper down on the floor uh, as low as he can possibly go, we've lowered the center, board, or center of gravity. But then really uh, the inspiration comes when you say, well, let's just get him up off the floor and put him outside the boat. Uh, we can really ramp up the speed now. Uh, this is a class racing boat, uh, a 1630, uh, which describes the length and width of the hull. And, uh, and you can see it's a lively boat. These don't stay upright on their own. Now, if you just carry on, this is actually an international tradition. Uh, it's, a, it's an internationally federated sport called the IC. 10 square meter uh, canoe um, or international canoe and what we have here with this hull are fast planing surfaces that skitter across the surface at the end it really cleans up and lifts the boat uh, out of that dent in the water that it's created um, the 10 square meter refers to the sail area and uh, trying to see how fast we can tune these boats and get them going this would be a very sort of brief uh, overview of of trying to make sense of some of the stranger creations that are in a collection and how do they how can we trace them back this is really important because as you look at the collection back there you are often wondering well where are the boundaries of our collection and if we stumbled upon that boat first you might say really it doesn't belong here this isn't part of a narrative that's to be found here um, we just as you know uh, uh, this spring uh, launched a our newest exhibit skimming the surface the unfolding story of sprint paddling and uh, a topic I, I didn't know a lot about before curating this show. It's, um, it's a re it, and now I'm just enchanted by it. Unfolding is an important uh, word in the title because this is a sport that has always been propelled and uh, shaped and, and, and struggled within by its enthusiasts, by the athletes and, and the designers. And uh, 
so again, much like the sprint story or the sailing story, if we take the original concept of a canoe, in fact, um, in the mid 1800s, Peterborough was really a hub for developing um, early efforts in canoe racing. You have the settler pioneering families here and the First Nations peoples getting together for regattas, some of them down on Little Lake, uh, and for the most part, favoring the dugout canoe, carving basswood as sleek and fast as they can. Uh, and without the complexities of building birch bark, certainly this was more, uh, more familiar to the, the pioneer families. In 1883, I've got two lovely little stories here to throw uh, into this. Canadians have really always been championing the open canoe. Uh, on the other side of the Atlantic in England, decked over double blade uh, canoes, as they are called. Um, today they have been confused with kayaks. Uh, they decked over double blade canoe, and same with the Americans. And, and it seems throughout the whole uh, canoe racing uh, tradition, Canadians in their formative years were always keeping the open canoe in the game. Um, William McKendrick, when he paddled to, uh, when he went to the first canoe association regatta in, on Stony Lake in 1883, he left his home down near Burlington uh, by canoe and paddled the north shore of Lake Ontario to Port Hope came up through the Trent Severn system to Stony Lake just to paddle in the races. Um, <laughs> another, another, uh, another great story uncovered for this exhibition. At the races that were taking place in the States, uh, a Canadian fishing guide from Rice Lake named uh, Wallace showed up, but he showed up in an open canoe with a single blade. And he didn't quite fit into the sport and they didn't know which event to put him in. Uh, really, the events were still being figured out at the time. You'd have long canoes, short canoes, double blade, single blade, people standing up doing some kind of windmill technique with a kayak. They were just working out all the systems. And Wallace shows up with a single blade and an open canoe. And he's a bit of an ugly duckling, it seems. They put him in a race, and um, he astonished and disappointed everybody by not only winning, but by winning and smoking a pipe the entire time. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> So as we leave just the open canoe that's being used to go as quickly as it can, eventually we need to standardize the races, the rules, and the shape of the boat. And we settle on a design that is later known as the peanut. Um, now the peanut is a, you could call it a C1. It's an open canoe uh, for one person, but they would also allow two paddles in this. So that would make it a C2. Uh, and as you can see with this one, it uh, also came with a double blade. So then we now, in today's language, call this a K1, kayak single paddle. Uh, and it, this one was also raced as a double K, so a double blade, double paddler. So it's a four-in-one boat. It was a standardized boat called the Peanut, uh, a charming little boat. This was made in Toronto by Walter Dean. Um, this is 1910. This takes us up just until the, the wartime period, or just after, uh, where we substituted traditional boat building method with fabulous new techniques developed during the Second World War of, of formed, um, veneered, uh, hulls uh, using mahogany veneer and an autoclave, phenolic resins, and so on. So the boats are uh, put into huge vacuum bags, put under high pressure and steam heat, and it shapes and molds. And really, uh, they're, they're developing some astonishing shapes working with wood uh, that could never be achieved. With this method allowed wooden hulls, surprisingly, to um, compete on pretty much an equal fo footing against the Kevlar racing canoes 40, 40 50 years later. Uh, wood was still showing up at races. It's, uh, it was, this method re was really a breakthrough design. And of course, uh, the Second World War allowed uh, a lot of experimenting with hull design and testing of hull shapes. So they were working at, in uh, water tanks, testing tanks, where they used to sh test battleship uh, scale models to see the performance and the fluid dynamics of the hulls. But here they could throw a 15, 16, 17 foot full-sized canoe in the water and put a paddler in it and see how it displaced in the water, how it performed, and so on, and so on. What's in, important about this design, another Scandinavia, uh, Scandinavian <coughs> designer named Samson, a real legend, he takes the requirements that 17 foot long hull that every canoe has to be and the 30 inch width, and he pushes it behind the paddler. And it may just seem um, like a bit of an affectation, but there's some important things going on here. One of which is that the paddler's stroke moves from um, the usual place right along the gunnel, but by moving the widest part behind me, my stroke can move just a little bit towards the keel line, and that reduces how much it pushes me off course. Reducing the number of J-strokes I have to throw in to get to the far end of the race. 
So if you t take two or three J strokes out, you are now pulling ahead by a quarter hull for a race, that kind of thing. So this, as, as simple as it is a strange looking boat, I agree, uh, but this was a real breakthrough design. Um, now, as we're touring through our collection, I have to throw this one in. I know I've talked to some of you about this. Uh, this is a boat I actually had our collections committee consider for the accession. Uh, it's not um, it's not in any way a thoroughbred, uh, not that we stick to those, the, the mongrels are in fact much more interesting. Um, but what's going on with this hull? It later turned out, uh, as I did more research on this, this canoe, that it was perfect for that exhibit on sprint canoes because uh, it's, it's, it's an utter failure in terms of the attempt and the success of the design, but it, it embodies the whole spirit of innovation that is there. Um, what we have here is a designer, an, an amateur designer, saying, well, what if we took the, the clean entry lines of a displacement hull? This is like an aircraft wing. It's a boat that's shaped to have optimal, um, uh, optimal performance within the dent in the water of its own making. Uh, there's, there's the least amount of friction and turbulence. But then to that, we, take, we create a centaur then by gluing onto the back end planing surfaces. That, like the back end of that sailing canoe we were looking at, you've got these broad, flat planes that under speed cause the boat to lift and skitter across its surface, provided it gets enough power. And that's the human in the middle of the boat. The dream was that this, the planing aft surfaces and the clean displacement entry lines would cause this boat to uh, tip on a wave of its own, own making and essentially surf to the finish line. Um, <laughs> like a, a perpetual motion machine. Uh, instead, what the poor thing did, I can only imagine, uh, there's no flotation in the front end, is it just buried its snout, <laughs> bobbed its back end up like a duck, and, uh, and was completely unmanageable. So the story goes, uh, they turned it around to see if it would paddle faster backwards. <laughs> and then it ended up in our collection. Uh, and we've displayed it in that exhibit uh, affectionately to, as, a, as a symbol, as, a, as an expression of that, that spirit of design and innovation. So back to the, uh, the, the fast boats that, that actually follow the, the tradition as it is, uh, unfolds. Uh, this is the uh, Polish breakthrough where they said, okay, yeah, so the boats need to be 30 inches wide, 17 feet long. We get it. But it, it doesn't say, what if we get rid of all of that extra boat and we take those points at the, 17 in, or the 30 inch wide mark and we pull them out of the hull <laughs> and we draw them together uh, essentially, if we pull them up six feet, the hull could be this wide, right, because of that splayed oh, angle. Okay. <laughs> so as long as the paddler can stay upright, um, there we have two integral parts of the hull that are 30 inches apart. They're behind the paddler. Oh, the rule said uh, the, the widest parts cannot also be the tallest. So they put the, sn the horn on the front deck, which is slightly taller than the, the uh, horns of midships. Uh, and the judges say, well, I'll be darned, it's legal. Uh, of course, now this boat is about this much narrower than any of the competition, cleans up, um, and uh, it's, it's only a decade later that they say, okay, let's get rid of this after the Sydney Olympics. And this is close to what a, uh, a canoe looks like today. Um, here's, here's a favorite athlete of ours. This is Laurence Vincent Lapointe. She's the fastest woman in the world. She's a Canadian athlete in the open canoe. Um, this boat might be, well, what's amazing is when you take away these restrictions, now the canoe is narrower than the kayak. It only has to accommodate your knee and your foot, whereas the kayak has to hold your hips. She couldn't sit in that. No, no. Uh, no, and if you look at these boats, they're, they're, uh, it's astonishing how they stay upright. Um, the paddle's wider than the boat. The paddle is wider than the boat, that's right. <laughs> So uh, here are some wonderful threads that, that allow us to explore <coughs> within this collection and we can uncover traditions as they evolve. When, when traditions get locked down, as we know, they begin to wither and die. Um, and so what I wanted to do uh, with this talk is really look at two, um, one iconic and one very strange uh, in our collection. Um, as you come into uh, our collection storage facility, people are greeted by this big gray boat on the right. Her name's Chichu. We'll learn a bit more about her in a minute. Uh, and often mistaken for a lobster boat. Um, I would call this a freighter canoe, but we really wanted to sort of pick away the story and see if there is a genetic connection between the two of these. Or is this really just an, uh, an imitator? Uh, and and, and uh, what do we do with that? How do we think about that? So as we're looking at big canoes of the north, um, I'm certainly drawn back to uh, a, a love affair I've had with these uh, most, most of my life. Um, I have copies of these books. I brought them in case anybody wants to see them. These are from when I was very young. Um, 
if you can see the blue one, there's actually a library stamp on it, um, and I've had this for now over 40 years. I <laughs> promise to return it uh, after I give this talk. <laughs> Normie's Moose Hunt and Normie's Goose Hunt were written by Vi Cowell. She's, uh, she was a teacher in Moosonine Moose Factory, I think in the 70s. And I think these are the most enchanting books. One book is about Normie and his family go off hunting moose, and, another, and they shoot a moose, and they come back, and Grandma makes mittens and boots out of it, and they dress all the meat. Uh, and in the other one, they go goose hunting. All of this takes place commuting out onto the landscape from the, the, uh, the reserve at Moose Factory in this wonderful big gray canoe that's just this sort of uh, lumbering uh, brute that's always in the background of the story. And I think that's where it begins for me. Um, <clears throat> large canoes, uh, are, in, in, as we think about them, are of course not a, uh, an invention of the modern times, nor are they an invention, invention uh, from the fur trade. Um, the large canoes, I guess, are most rec uh, recognizable from the fur trade period. But if we think even just to the, what is now the logo <laughs> of the Canadian Canoe Museum, this is a, a pictograph from a rock face up near Thunder Bay. We're not quite sure how old this is. It hasn't been uh, uh, dated through radiocarbon analysis. Um, it might be from the fur trade period because there's actually some writing on the rock nearby. S-I-M-O, Simo. Might be phonetic, sounding, uh, phonetic spelling for Simon. Might be a Christian name for an Anishinaabe man. Might have been a voyager. This could be a voyager canoe. I suspect it's older than that. Um, but we, we, uh, we know from Cartier's writing and Champlain in uh, 16, early 1600s, an early Champlain expedition, they acquired a 30-foot bark canoe and sent it back to France. 30-foot birch bark canoe, they would purchase it from the Mi'kmaq uh, near Port Royal. Put, uh, they were running out of funds. The uh, Champlain was an underling at this time, so Sieur de Mont, uh, headed back to France to get more support from the crown, and he brought with him a 30-foot birch bark gift, painted red uh, on the inside and out, they unloaded it at all flower on the Seine River. The sailors got into the boat and paddled it with, at great speed. I have no idea what happened to it. I'd love to find out. It, it might have ended up maybe at the Louvre. Uh, it might have been flattened by a piano. It might have been engraved. I would love to find even an engraving of the canoe. Uh, but this takes us back 400 years. But of course, birch bark canoes, as long as that or longer, would have been used uh, at intervals uh, over, over centuries. The only limiting factor to them is that they don't last long and they limit what waterways you can paddle on. So that's why we wouldn't see many of these unless you have transcontinental shipping business that the fur trade requires. Um, in 1607, the, uh, with a stroke of a pen, the Hudson Bay Company was both formed and granted uh, an astonishingly large land mass for trading. Uh, this is all the rivers and straits that drain into James Bay and Hudson Bay. Uh, the Hudson Bay Company had recently landed at the bottom of James Bay in 1607, right there at Rupert House. Um, it was a, a small native a Cree community on the shore, uh, and they set up shop and attract, attracted to the Cree to the shore for trade. Uh, and it wasn't long before the Rupert River, which drains into Rupert House, um, was seen as an, an important tributary. The Hudson Bay Company, for the most part, just sat by the bay as we know in its early years, early centuries, uh, and waited for the First Nations to either trade with them or for them to become middlemen and bring trade to the coasts. Uh, later they got energized into trading because the French were moving up from the south in birch bark canoes and, and stealing their, uh, their market. So, in the early 1820s, a, uh, a survey was done here to see if that would be the best place to set up an important not only trading post but also as a trunk line into the interior. That river, the Rupert River, takes you in from James Bay and of course uh, direct connection to Europe, takes you up, uphill over land at, uh, just past Mistassini and essentially down into the St. Lawrence Lowlands. So it was an important connector route and birch bark canoes were uh, of course the means to get around. Um, <clears throat> a few years ago I want to talk a little bit about uh, the making of these boats because a canoe yard was set up there. As many of you know, we built a, a large birch bark canoe uh, here about 12 years ago. Barry Diceman was very much involved in it. Um, we had to acquire birch bark for this project. So was Jen Bernard and Peter Knapp. Um, we had to acquire bark for this. Uh, that's really the make or break. And birch bark supplies were always uh, in scarcity. And in, in fact, it became an important trade good in the fur trade. You can see all of the rolls of bark we had acquired here 
for making this canoe and more rolled down. Um, birch bark became a trade good uh, as an alternative to furs in trade. So, uh, if, and this was actually advantageous, if you were in areas that had been largely trapped out, um, uh, native people could actually go skin birch trees, chop them down, skin them out, and a good roll of canoe bark. Um, we understand a good roll of canoe bark was a fathom wide, that's six feet wide, by uh, four fathoms long, 24 feet long. Mm -hmm. This is a birch tree like this, straight as a mast for 30 feet. That's a standard roll of canoe bark. Um, that was the equivalent of a beaver pelt in trade. So uh, it wouldn't take you long if you were into some good birch to, uh, to put together the 11 or so that would be needed to purchase a musket, or the 7 or 8, depending on what time period we're talking for a blanket. Um, if we look at this gr photograph, this is also found in our exhibits. It's a, an amazing photograph if we can pluck away all the details. This is a, a north canoe pulling in at a train station at Kippewa <coughs> on Temiskaming. Um, what that means is the birch bark canoe is being dovetailed with trains as a shipping method to bring furs down to market. Uh, you have an ancient Aboriginal technology combined with state of the art. Um, and what's rolled up on top of these furs are birch bark rolls. And these are always being moved about uh, f to supply the canoe builders, right? The larger the bark canoe, the shorter the lifespan. A canoe like this might last three years. You're always having to replace your fleet. Um, maybe a third of the fleet every year needs to be replaced so that they're robust enough to, to manage the rivers. Um, <clears throat> here we are making uh, that Montreal canoe, Jen Bernard down below, and a former employee of us, uh, Rhonda Lee McIsaac. Um, they're the human sewing machine working out the long <laughs> seams down the sides of the boat. We understand from the, uh, the fur trade record, say at Fort William, that um, a canoe like this one here, which was made for George Simpson, Sir George, uh, in, in, uh, after 1821, this took somewhere around a week and a half to make. Um, on Tuesday, May 11th, begins the governor's canoe, and about a week and a half later finishes the canoe for the governor. Well, it's impossible. Um, really to start to finish to do all that. What's buried in that text is that they've made all of the wood pieces ahead of time. They've even bent the ribs most likely. Everything's ready for assembly. And when, when Antoine Collin, the canoe builder, begins making the governor's canoe, he's unrolling it, but there are whole teams of Anishinaabe moms and sometimes their daughters who came in and were hired on piecework to sew boats together. Um, this is an important thing as well because it allowed Native women to uh, enter directly into trade. They would have been arranged. They were paid often in food and fabric, um, but this was a means of getting what you needed through the <coughs> trade transaction. Otherwise, uh, Aboriginal women were um, were veiled by a man in their family, whether it was a brother, a father, or a, a husband, who would take gen generally take um, the the furs to the trade exchange. Uh, this was a means of them actually getting in if they lived near a post uh, such as this. So uh, the canoe would be assembled, they'd blitz the hull, sew it together. So when they made the, the governor's canoe, really what's not recorded there is this, I would imagine, very noisy, chattering din of, of canoe sewers who are assembling the, the seams. It took us about a month, uh, Jen, if I'm right, to sew the longitudinal seams on this boat. That might have been a day, day and a half's work uh, for such a team. As you can see also, birch bark canoes, and this is really important as we go further in this talk, bark canoes, just to remind, are made from the outside in. We start with the skin, we start with the waterproof, and we add a longitudinal layer to that, and that distributes the pressure from the internal framing, the rib cage that's driven in, it distributes the pressure of those ribs against the birch bark. The bark is aligned on the canoe the same way as it was around the tree, except it's turned inside out, but the fibers of the birch bark go from side to side, and if you drive those ribs into tension the hull and there's no planking, uh, every rib will split the canoe at every, every location. So you always need three layers to this. And that's pretty much the case how you look at it with most boat uh, technologies. It's just very rare to see a boat made from the outside in. Here we are launching the boat. We had three ton of payload. We ran out of these uh, barrels. Um, to, uh, to bring it right up to the full, full four ton or 8,000 pound payload uh, on the water. Um, and uh, my gosh, there's my daughter. Uh, she's <laughs> almost my height now. Uh, so with, with three ton in it, we had 14, 16 inches of freeboard. We would assume we would have lost another four, maybe five, had we brought up to the last ton. Um, we're getting close. When, when you read the journals of those paddling in these boats, they talk about 
um, being fully loaded, these canoes, the water was six inches from the gunnels. They're at Montreal, they're about to head up the Ottawa River. As you know, the Ottawa is in flood in the spring, the ice is just flushed out. Uh, it's big water coming downstream and they have half a foot of water. This is somebody writing in his journal who has just said, oh, the roots that are sewing this canoe together are a quarter of an inch thick. The ribs are three-eighths of an inch thick by about three and a half inches wide. They, they understand what an inch is, for instance, and then they say, they drop this little bomb that there's only six inches of boat above the surface. Um, I, I, I can't imagine what that would have felt like. They were certainly horrified, these young Scots who had just got off the boat, who were given a job through an uncle in the interior and never believing they'd make it. And meanwhile, these voyageurs and Anishinaabe and Mohawk uh, paddlers are just hopping in like it's nothing at all. Uh, and some filming we did with uh, uh, the BBC on the French River that's lining up a set of rapids. Anyway, I have a lot more to cover, so I just want to take us back into the back building as we look at some of the large boats in our collection. This is one I'm often asked about on tour. Um, and I've never really known uh, until recently uh, how to interpret this boat. It's an oddity. It's the longest birch bark canoe I've ever seen. It's something like 42 feet long. Um, and when I first started working here uh, almost two decades ago, I was told that these ends were so shaped for ramming. Uh, which in a, in a birch bark canoe is really a, a murder suicide. <laughs> Uh, I suspect that maybe what had happened is, is mid-construction they learned that there was another bark canoe uh, of 36 feet long, so they said, well, let's just make ours longer. It doesn't fit any kind of cultural tradition. Um, and then later on I learned that it had been made for a 1970s reenactment descent uh, of the Mississippi, uh, reenacting La Salle's descent three centuries earlier. Um, so it's, it's not a canoe from any uh, historical time frame. It's a reenactment boat. It has these oddly shaped ends, well still what are we going to do about it? And when our, our dear founder died some years ago, Kirk Quipper's uh, death, we had a wake uh, party here, I think many of you were at it, hundreds of people came in, and I was doing again my usual walk about the collection, and uh, somebody said, oh you still have that boat? But you, you, know, you know Kirk only took that because he wanted the trailer it was on. <laughs> and, and frankly the trailer's not much good either, so um, this will uh, fall to the deaccession acts uh, at some point soon, so um, I, I will try to find it a good home. Uh, it wouldn't make very good bookshelves, um, but it, it might end up in the Montanas, uh, or maybe the, the original makers might want it back. So as we uh, look at Northern Exploration and understanding the Canadian North, the canoe continues to play in a very important role uh, at the late 1800s. Um, now we're finding out not only uh, river routes, and a lot of those were somewhat understood, many of the main trunk lines were understood because of the fur trade, but we're also trying to find out uh, what minerals are here, what kind of wealth is in the north. Uh, certainly missionaries are trying to meet uh, and greet with northern populations. We have a new boundary being, um, being determined between uh, Yukon and Alaska. And maiden manufacturing, major manufacturers in the Peterborough area were supplying boats for a lot of these expeditions. <coughs> so we have the Peterborough Canoe Company, uh, and this is Tyrrell here, standing bravely beside his rugged canoe used in the north. Um, Walter Dean in Toronto uh, had made in 1898 the Klondike model canoe, which is uh, for the grub stakers heading north. These are large freighter canoes that could be broken into three sections and, and carried up the Chilkoot <coughs> Pass uh, and so on. So these are all wood construction made in a manufacturing setting using fairly sophisticated machined joinery, uh, a lot of high level skill going into them of a, of, a, of a canoe manufacturing technique, very unlike the birch bark canoe. And what's important about that is that in, while the fur trade carries on in the north, those modern manufacturers, these Peterborough canoes were not being really embraced uh, by the native populations in the north. Here we are back at Rupert River at the bottom end of James Bay on the Quebec side. And here we have large voyageur canoes, as they have been doing now for centuries, running trade goods into the interior and coming back out on fur, full of furs. In 1902, the chief, uh, the chief of the uh, Waskaganish uh, band, his name is Isterhoff, he um, leads the community in pioneering with canvas. Uh, so what they're doing are making large Voyager canoes, but they're using canvas instead. So it's still being built from the outside out, unrolling a roll of canvas, not birch bark, on the prepared bed, which is dirt, uh, putting a pattern down on it, pulling <coughs> the canvas up around the pattern, attaching the gunnels, closing in the ends, making this basket, 
this envelope of cloth. Take the pattern out and then as we can see here, lining it with ribs and sheathing, that planking. And you're driving the ribs in, everything's held together by friction. Um, doing some digging in about this, it, it's, it's a, a lovely story because the, um, the canoe building at Rupert House transforms as we will see a great deal. They're still traveling from Rupert House down to the very bottom of the bay and into the interior to get their cedar. So they're, they're paddling down, they're felling cedars uh, up the broad back in, in that area to the south of James Bay to get all of the canoe wood and coming out with bundles, I would assume, of ribs and, and, and planking and everything else rather than transporting up the logs but working with canvas. Uh, Easterhoff, the chief, and the Hudson Bay Company were bringing in the canvas uh, at, at cost. Now, in 1921, a, real, a very important change happens. A canoe building mold is brought in from northern Alberta. Uh, again, the chief uh, and the Hudson Bay Company said, well, let's, let's try changing things. Instead of building birch bark canoes made of canvas, we'll, we'll, we'll work on this new method that had emerged out of New England of taking a canoe-shaped last cobbler's last, if you will, or an anvil, that over which you assemble a canoe. You steam bend ribs and you line ribs on top of these metal bands and then you lay your planking longitudinally over top. You have soft nails and you drive them through and they drive through the two layers of wood and they clinch on the form and you're actually able to pull a wooden canoe off of this mold. This really standardizes the shape. It also accelerates it. Um, and the canoe builders at Rupert House in, in 1921 embraced this wholeheartedly. Uh, you can't really make it out here. If we, as we look at the canvas on this, it's really puckered and wrinkled here. So I think there's still some bugs being worked out. Um, but however, down at the wetted surface, uh, things are good. You can actually see some of those wrinkles there. So here's one of these canvas canoes made over a mold uh, on, a, on a form that had been brought in from uh, Alberta. From the, so we understand it was from the Arctic Boat Company uh, supplying the Hudson Bay Company. I haven't been able to find a lot about them. Um, and Rupert House really sets up and becomes an important manufacturer of these canoes, and they're being um, used predominantly for the fur trade. Elsewhere in the northern Arctic, um, there was one maker uh, who was able to supply boats for the native canoe brigades from the south, and this is Chestnut. Uh, Chestnut was really known for and specialized uh, in canvas-covered canoes. Out of New Brunswick, it was a, a simpler route for them to, to come up by uh, northern shipment uh, up from the St. Lawrence up across the, the north end in the supply boats. And so these are canoe men, uh, I, I believe these are Inuit canoe men, uh, at, uh, heading in f um, on the Coxwalk River towards Fort Chimo, made on chestnut canoe form. So these were would have been stacked and brought in. What's fun about that is we have, I believe, the molds that those canoes were made on. Uh, here's the 22 foot stack from chestnut. And if, you, if I could zoom, I want you to look at this staining around the, the steel bands. That is thousands upon thousands of tacks that have just missed the stem bed, oh. the, stems, the steel bands. It gives you a sense of the volume of production that was pulled off of the, the number of canoes that were born off of these boats. Um, I love them for that, that, that kind of signature of, of heavy, heavy use. The other signature they carry are modifications to meet new markets. And this is, this is a, the same mold. It's a double ender, but they've added on these cheeks to carry a small kicker on the back. Um, so that's again responding to a new market. Where were those motors made? Those motors were made right in our building, of yeah. course, across the parking lot, down in the factory of Outboard Marine. This is another influence that's coming onto this. So not only are we seeing canvas uh, replacing bark canoes for these heavy boats, but here we see Chestnut's uh, catalog, and here's, uh, it's really bleached out in this, but here we can see um, them, them offering this. this. It's really a river boat. Uh, it's not such a laker boat um, because at the water line you have a double-ended boat. This is a displacement hull. Uh, it's, it's, it's a slower traveling boat. It's good for a light motor, but certainly if you spend a lot of time going upstream uh, in, in current, uh, that's a godsend. Mm -hmm. And if they can carry a drum of, of gas along with them, uh, it certainly speeds things up a great deal for northern travel. So back to James Bay and Rupert House, and I'm still picking away at the story. Um, now the, f the, the sort of heady days of the fur trade have come to an end. Second World War uh, also has come to an end. And the canoe builders at Rupert House, so I understand, um, fill a new need and a new ecological uh, niche, if you will, by producing um, something like a commuter boat. Remember back to Normie's goose hunt and moose hunt? Mm -hmm. 
Here are his boats right there. These are long river boats, about 22 feet long with a little wide stern uh, transom at the back end to hang a motor. The Cree, like many Aboriginal peoples in the north, um, have moved um, off the land to the settlements. Uh, uh, now, but they still maintain a very much committed connection to the land uh, and are heading back out seasonally uh, or for months at a time or just to go up uh, because it's the goose hunt or, or what have you. So um, rather than making canoe, brigade canoes, these long double-ended voyageur canoes if you will, the canoe factory that's happening at R Rupert House has just switched over to feed a new market and make these commuters for Cree and Inuit families to get back out on the land. Uh, with the resettlement that's happened. You can also see in the background some much bigger, <coughs> chunkier boats that if you see the back ends of them, they have a big square back and that's a you know much more coastal going boat like this white one here. Uh, that's a, a flat back lake canoe. Here's a great photograph. We're loading the large uh, freighter canoes that are being made and these are being shipped around on sea lift or the supply ships to other northern, northern communities. So leaving the Cree canoe factory at Rupert House and being sold uh, to other uh, communities across the north. Here's uh, a year's supply lined up uh, to be shipped out. And here's a great photo. I, I need to find his name um, at Waskaganish at Rupert House. And he's uh, putting finishing touches on a large freighter canoe. And I want you to look at the way the light falls on this boat. Look how it rolls over the hull and then kicks out there. We're going to come back to that in a sec. Now, if you come back into our back building, into the collection storage facility, here's my the beloved Chichu. Um, she's a canoe that came to us from uh, Picton from Prince Edward County. And her story, story goes as following. Uh, uh, George Chichu from Moose Factory uh, was a, a, a Cree hunting guide and he would take sport hunters out regularly for as an income and we go goose hunting we go moose hunting what have you go fishing and uh, one year um, a regular client of his named Claude Winters who was a game warden from Lake Ontario on Prince Edward County uh, one year bought Chi Chu's boat and had it shipped down I assume by Polar Bear Express the train line yeah. from uh, from church, uh, from uh, Moose Factory Moosonee and uh, Claude Winters built this uh, wheelhouse and the cuddy up front, um, and it's such a boat of layers. So originally you have this large wood canvas freighter canoe, big square back on it, um, and as uh, we've been uncovering, this has trace, traceable lineage right back through the fur trade canoes and so on. Um, was it made at Rupert House? Well, we're still not sure. sure. What's interesting about the design of the cabin here is that the steering wheel's out of a cabin cruiser of some some sort. The driver's seat comes out of a Second World War bomber. Uh, as Barry knows, because he and Randy have been working very hard on this boat, getting it all back up to ship shape, uh, and even rewiring all of its systems again. Behind the, the dashboard console is a fuse panel out of a Second World War bomber that has uh, de-icers for the pitot tube uh, and all kinds of other uh, aircraft system uh, fuses on it. It's quite wonderful. The gas tank's out of a Ford. The uh, right, you can barely see it here, the motor for the windshield wipers comes out of a 1950s uh, Volkswagen bus. Um, Barry's just got that back up and working again. It has the same with the lights. And it's fog light, which is right here. Uh, used to be, I would imagine, a spotlight on a handle so he could ghost up along Lake Ontario and catch you while you're poaching salmon out of season or what have you. Uh, so Chichu's had a good life up in the north and then down on Lake Ontario and has come to us. Now, look at that bell curve right there, that, that nice shape to the hull. What's going on there? And you can't really see it here. This is really problematic for me because I've built only a few of these wood canvas canoes, but when you wrap ribs around the hull, they're going to bend over the inverted hull, uh, the mold, and then they're going to more or less go to the gunnels and nail them down. If you try to bend them in, they'll do that, but they'll generally just bounce back out again. If for some reason you were able to, or somehow you were able to suck them in while you put your planking on, take it off the mold, and now you stretch canvas from here, what's it going to do? It's going to do a straight line right up to the gunnel. Yeah. What's important about this, and we saw that shape in that one photograph from Rupert House, that white canoe that was upside down in the grass, he was sanding it. You can see in the photo that, of him, and we can see on this boat, this boat has been fiberglass. So this shape, they thought, well, let's give it some flare to that hull to avert that wash that you get on big waters. 
uh, so that will help deflect the waves and the wash away from the open boat that we have. So they've gone to great lengths and great trouble to give it that internal shape uh, in the framing. Um, but you could never canvas a canoe like that and preserve that shape. So this is, the, as the canoe builders in Rupert House went from birch bark to canvas, they've now modified these molds in the 60s to accommodate this new fabric of fiberglass, <coughs> which is now uh, ma being made available. Um, so it's yet one more innovation that's happening up there. So um, I've talked to um, uh, another company that we'll see in a moment who say that Chichi was not made, made by them. I'm now 100% sure that Chichi was made at Rupert House, which is lovely to have since she came from Moose Factory originally. And uh, from what I found, nobody else was creating that form. It's great to be able to close that loop. <coughs> Now, uh, Rupert House uh, wraps things up, making the uh, large freighter canoes in the 70s. For a brief period, they switched to all fiberglass motorboats, uh, very unsuccessful, and then things were allowed to die. Um, meanwhile, there's one person, or one company, left producing these big, heavy freighter canoes. And this is a, a small company that's operating out of Quebec, out of a town called Prévost, uh, north of Montreal. And they've been quietly producing large northern canoes since the 40s, just after the Second World War. And this fellow here, his name is Augustin Gariepi. Um, he uh, set up shop in Prévost, Quebec. Um, but from what I understand, Pré uh, Gariepi grew up in Alberta, in northern Alberta, helping his father, who was a blacksmith with the Hudson Bay Company. And um, he also helped his father working on boats. Now I'm wondering, in a, in a loop yet to confirm and close, but I suspect that we might be right, is Gariepi worked for the company whose mold was shipped to Rupert House in the 1920s. So funnily enough, Getty E.P. carries on, and, and this company carries on producing these boats today. Where Getty E.P. learned how to make these canoes provided a mold that ended up in Rupert House and completely transformed canoe buildings there. And in fact, he then migrates from Alberta to Quebec after the Second World War and starts producing canoes <coughs> over forms the same way. So there's this lovely circle that gets closed between these two companies. On their own, um, Gary P's company is called Norwest, Norwest can Canoe Norwest, Northwest Canoes, uh, and they are an amazing uh, outfit that still trucks along today. If you uh, have go up onto beaches on Baffin Island or around James Bay, uh, you still see a lot of these. Astonishingly, you still see a lot of these today. It's 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 exciting for me when I still see wooden canoes that are fresh off of a mold or fresh from a, a shop being purchased and used in the north. And while we see a lot of fiberglass boats in the north as well, and there may be uh, a, a gradual shift, uh, you know, these may become less and less common, uh, they're still a much beloved canoe of the north. They are certainly iconic uh, right across the north. And uh, this is Northwest's Deckel. You can see just how common and pervasive they are. Uh, having traveled in these, uh, I was in one again most recently two weeks ago in Tomogamy, and it's just an enchanting ride. Um, there's something um, big and, and strong and, and, uh, and elegant at the same time of these. And really, for my money, they are the last of the, uh, the, the workboat culture within the canoe family in, in Canada. And I think there's a nobility in that. For Northwest uh, producing boats, they make canoes from double enders at 16 feet right up to 24 feet, big, huge. Um, uh, coastal going boats. 90, over 90 percent of their sales are in Nunavut, Nunavik, northern Quebec, uh, and uh, also NWT. Uh, and these are being packaged up and shipped. They're producing, uh, I believe, uh, about 160 of these hulls every year. That's a lot. That really is a lot. Um, yeah, especially in, the, in today's world of aluminum fabrication and fiberglass. And what's wonderful about this great company uh, is that they are still a family-owned business. They're on their third generation uh, of, of family ownership. The Getty AP are still running the boats and they're the company and they're still on the, on the shop floor producing the hulls. Uh, they have a wonderful system now working with epoxy in the, uh, in the canvas, getting a much longer longevity out of the greater longevity out of the canvas cloth. And why do these boats continue to s survive in the, in the Canadian North, uh, in the world of fiberglass hulls and everything else? And I think there's a, a lot to be said just for how effective they are in the North, for the lightweight hull, for how well they travel with a reasonably small motor, um, and, and how seaworthy they are in her horrible conditions, in terrible conditions. You can actually pull them up on a beach, uh, which is an, an important plus. 
Uh, I've been uh, in Baffin Island, pulled up onto an ice pan and we for a stopping while we cooked a whole seal or some of the seal <laughs> on the ice. And this was just sort of pulled up uh, onto the ice pan and part and then anchored off. And it was just such a versatile way to get around the north and to see what kind of a role that plays. Um, and, and another reason that these traditions often last is just because they work and they're familiar. And, uh, and maybe in some ways they, they uh, reach back to uh, a, a much older northern boat, the birch bark canoe. But there in this hull are all the genetics that we'd be looking for to fully understand them and see them in the, in the embrace of our collection.